All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our RBT practice question series where we're going through the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Lucy always teases Charlie Brown, but recently has gotten out of control. Lucy just teases Charlie Brown for his attention, so Lucy's teacher wants to teach Lucy a replacement behavior that will also get Charlie's attention. What strategy should Lucy's teacher not use? All right, the question is asking you about the strategy that she should not use, meaning three of these answer choices, or two, are going to be strategies she can use. So what do we know about Lucy's teacher and the strategy? Well, Lucy teases Charlie Brown, but it's gotten out of control. She teases Charlie Brown, for attention. So Lucy's teacher is going to teach her a replacement behavior that will also get Charlie's attention. We call this a functionally equivalent behavior. When you remove or reduce a behavior, you want to replace it with something that's going to serve the same purpose and function. So the teacher is doing the right thing here, teaching a replacement behavior. Now, what strategy should she not use to teach that replacement behavior? A, differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors. Will a DRA procedure teach a replacement? Sure. Is it the best intervention to use? Well, that's unclear. We don't know any more information than what's given in the question, but if she wants to teach a replacement behavior, a DRA is fine. It's going to help reduce one behavior and teach another. What about B, a differential reinforcement of incompatible behaviors, a DRI? Does a DRI teach a replacement? It does. Same as a DRA, except the, diff the incompatible behaviors, the replacement behavior cannot occur at the same time as the old behavior. Is it better than a DRA? Unclear. We're not sure about more information, but we do know if she wants to teach a replacement behavior, the teacher, both the DRA and the DRI are fine. What about C, differential reinforcement of other behaviors? Does a DRO teach replacement behaviors? It does not. So if she wants to teach a replacement behavior, a differential reinforcement of other behaviors is not going to be acceptable because the DRO reinforces when a behavior isn't occurring, not necessarily to teach a replacement behavior, but to focus on reducing a target behavior very quickly. So if she wants to teach a replacement behavior, the teacher should not use C, differential reinforcement of other behaviors. Santa asks his assistant to calculate the number of houses he needs to deliver presents to Christmas Eve. Santa's assistant starts to count the number of nice kids on Santa's list, and then gives Santa the total number. What measurement did the assistant use? So we have a measurement question. Let's look at what we're measuring. We know Santa wants his assistant to calculate the number of houses he needs to deliver presents to Christmas Eve. So we're measuring the number of something. So already you should be thinking frequency or rate. Frequency and rate has to do with the count. Latency into response time and duration has to do with time. So Santa's assistant starts to count. Again, there's that word. The number of nice kids on Santa's list. And they give Santa the total number. So what does Santa's assistant measure? She measures nice kids on Santa's list. How did she measure, measure those kids? By counting. So count is also known as what? A, rate. Rate would be frequency over time. Do we have a time component here? We don't. We only have our count. If it said something like Santa needs to deliver to 100 houses per minute, that would be rate. Well, we simply just have a total number of kids who are nice on Santa's list. So what measurement we're looking at is B, frequency. Frequency is also known as the count. It's not latency. Latency is a time in between the SD in the first response, we're not measuring time in between here, and then partial interval. Partial interval would be a time sampling or an interval recording, or broadly known as a discontinuous measurement procedure. And we're not using discontinuous measurement because we're taking this total number of kits. So we're not using time sampling, we're not using interval recording, we're not measuring time, we're not measuring throughout a duration of time. We're simply taking the count. So the measurement the assistant used is B, frequency. Pretty straightforward measurement question. If you struggled, go back and review the task list study guide 
your different direct measurements, or your I should say your different continuous measurements. Oliver receives $100 for Christmas from his favorite uncle, but Oliver does not seem too excited. Oliver's uncle asks Oliver if he likes to gift, and Oliver says, what do I do with this? What likely has not occurred yet relative to Oliver's reaction? So we're looking at Oliver's reaction and what happened in this scenario. Well, Oliver got $100 for Christmas, was not excited. Oliver's uncle asked why, and Oliver said, well, what do I do with this? Now, why would Oliver look at a $100 bill and ask, what do I do with this? That's because money is what we know what we consider a secondary reinforcer. It's conditioned. Money holds no value until we start to pair it with other items that do have value. So if Oliver says, what do I do with this $100 bill? Something is missing there. A, Oliver is uninterested in buying things. Do we know that at all? Is there anything in the question to make us think Oliver is uninterested in buying things? No. He simply just says, what do I do with the $100 bill? We can't make the assumption that Oliver is interested in buying things based on the information given. B, money has not been paired with backup reinforcers. What needs to happen for that money to gain value? Just like tokens, it has to be paired with backup reinforcers. In other words, items that do hold value. Once Oliver exchanges that $100 for toys or whatever else he buys, that money gains value. C, Oliver does not know how to count. Nothing in the question stem, nothing in the prompt, question prompt, however you want to view it, implies Oliver can't count. We're talking strictly about this $100 bill or the $100 he got from his uncle. He said, what do I do with that $100 bill? Nothing about counting. And then D, Oliver does not understand the concept of gifts. Again, we're not assuming any of these things because nothing in the question is leading us down that road. The only thing we know about the question is Oliver got $100. He asked, what do I do with this? Why? Well, likely, based on what we know, the money has not yet been paired with backup reinforcers. Remember, only use the information given. Pick the best answer choice available. Yuri wants to help his supervisor create a task analysis for a client. Task analysis is for washing a car so that the client can get a job this summer. What would be the least desirable way to conduct this task analysis? All right, this is a more high-level question, so we're going to learn some things here. Now, when we're doing a task analysis, what are we doing? We're breaking down a complex behavior into steps in order to teach a task chain. So the task analysis comes first. We have to analyze that task or the behavior for the steps. And what Yuri wants to do is create a task analysis for his client for washing a car so he can get a job. Now, what's the least desirable way to do the task analysis? Meaning three of these would be more desirable than the fourth one, which would be the least desirable. A, Yuri washes the car himself and writes down his steps. A is a totally acceptable way to do a task analysis. You look at your own behavior. So you engage, if let's, let's just say we're, we're teaching hand washing. You would go through hand washing and write down the steps. Totally acceptable way to do a task analysis. What about B? Yuri observes someone competent washing a car and writes down their steps. Sure, if someone is competent enough to wash the car, Yuri can take their steps down and then create a task analysis that way. What about C? Yuri observes an employee of the car wash washing a car and writes down their steps. Sure, that employee of the car wash is probably trained on the car wash or is at least knowledgeable about the car wash. And so, when we're doing a task analysis, we want somebody competent, we want an expert, or we can watch or observe ourselves do the task. What we don't want to do is D. Yuri observes someone the same age as the client washing a car. Why not? Well, we don't know how old Yuri is. We don't know Yuri's skill level. Let's say Yuri is 17. What if we observe someone the same age as Yuri and they're terrible at washing a car? Or they don't do a good job. We need somebody who can actually do the skill appropriately in order to gather the steps to create a task analysis. So the worst way to do the task analysis is to look at someone at the same age level or developmental level. You want somebody who's very proficient in whatever behavior or task you are trying to analyze. Again, higher level, this is more behavior analytic in nature, which is fine. We're learning and we're expanding our knowledge base, which is gonna make us better RBTs, 
and better at the exam. It is almost Christmas time, and one of the families you, a behavior technician, work, works with, wants to buy you a gift. They haven't bought you anything all year and ask you what you would like. What are the rules about taking gifts from your clients? That time of year where gifts are flying around and your families are probably trying to thank you and on and on and on. New ethics code at least relaxed the rules a little bit. Before the new ethics code, you weren't allowed any gifts, which in my opinion was unreasonable, but you're not here for my opinion. So with the ethics code, the new one, it's relaxed it a little bit. So what are the rules now? If one of the families you work with wants to buy you a gift, what are those rules? They haven't bought you anything all year. A, you're not allowed to take gifts at all. New ethics code, this is not true. There are stipulations to taking gifts. B, you can take gifts, but only once a year. The code does not specify once a year. It just says it cannot be on a regular basis. So it only wants gifts for special, special occasions. C, you can take gifts of $10 or less and value at any point in the year. Your gift needs to be of $10 or less, but you can't take it every day. D, you can take gifts of $10 or less in value as long as it is not, as it is not a common occurrence. D is the closest to what the new ethics code says. The gift has to be $10 or less in value, and it can't be common. It can't be a regular thing. It's got to be a special occasion. If your family wants to give you a gift card or your client wants to give you, you know, I got a magnet one year. That's great. $10 or less in value, that's fine. It can't be common. It can't be regular. It has to be $10 or less in value. Those are the current rules for taking gifts. If your goal was to increase the duration of a behavior, which of the following measurement would likely be the best to use? So we want to increase duration of a behavior, meaning how long that specific behavior occurred for. Which measurement would be best? You look at our answer choices, we have whole interval, partial interval, momentary time sampling, and play check, all discontinuous measurements. So let's think about what each one does, because we want to increase the duration of behavior. So A, whole interval, the behavior has to occur the entire time. So let's say we have 15 second intervals. That behavior has to occur for 15 seconds. B, partial interval, we had a 15 second interval. That behavior has to only occur at any point in those 15 seconds, and it counts as a response. Momentary time sampling, it has to occur at the very end of the response, so for a split second. And then play check is just momentary time sampling for groups. So with B and C, the only requirement for the behavior to count as a response is that it occurs for a split second. If we want to increase the duration of a behavior, it's not really going to help us, because each interval only counts as one response. The response only has to occur for a second. Whole interval, however, is different. If we want to increase the duration of a behavior, we might go from 10 seconds intervals to 15 second intervals, 20 second intervals, and the client has to engage in the behavior the whole interval, no matter how long that interval is. So that's going to slowly increase the duration of the behavior. So if our goal is to increase the duration of a behavior, what measurement is, is best to use? Well, a whole interval. If you don't understand this question, which is a little harder, go back and let's review our discontinuous measurement procedures. Think about for each procedure, what counts as a response? and How would that increase duration of a behavior? Thank you for watching. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials. Make sure you like and subscribe. Let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.